So welcome back to this uh, third video lecture of the uh, module about OWL, about uh, advanced inferencing. Uh, class has just given an overview over different ways of uh, defining, uh, uh, dealing with classes and with properties in OWL. And I will continue on this with some more about class restrictions. So these were the things that uh, class discussed uh, and um, there are different things you can say about the classes. You can say that they are the same. So um, A class A would be equivalent to class B. And this implies already very interesting things because if you know that something is in A, then you can infer that this A in A is also in B and vice versa, of course. If something is in B, you can infer that it is in, uh, in A. You can define that two classes are the complement of each other. So basically everything that is not an A must be a B. This is this outside thing. And that is again something you can, uh, is very useful because you can derive things about the fact. So if A is in A, then you know that it is uh, not in B. And vice versa, if you have an object B, which is in B, then you know that it cannot be in A. This is a bit different from the, the disjunction, the disjointness of the two. So if you say that A and B are disjoint, you can derive that uh, there is nothing in the intersection of the two. But you cannot further derive anything because there could be things outside A and B that are not discussed, uh, that are not specified any further. What you can say is if you have an intersection of the two, that uh, everything that is in A and B intersected will be in A and also in B. So if you see that A an object A is in A intersection B, then you can derive that it is in also in A and that it is also in B. You cannot derive this if you have the union because the object could be either here and, or here. So um, if you know that something is either an animal or a human, uh, then you cannot derive that it's an animal because it could be a human. There's another thing which is called the, the um, um, disjoint class, um, disjoint union, where uh, you know that two things cannot be, um, that the thing cannot be in both, in both classes at the same time. This is sometimes very useful. You can define, for example, the class of humans as the, the uh, disjoint union of men and female, men and, and women. Um, there's another thing that is interesting to, to use is if you if you know uh, how many objects and which ob objects a class ha has then you can define your class as being exactly those instances so if you want to define the weekdays then it's usually rather painful if you want to do this in, a, in, a, in an abstract way but if you say the weekdays are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, and these are the seven possible objects in my class then this is easy to define and OWL provides one means of doing this. The one thing that is more complicated is to reuse uh, classes as objects in OWL, the, the so-called punning, and we will talk about this later. So now there's one thing that, that always is uh, rather difficult to understand for students, so we'll have to be really very careful here. Uh, and this is the distinction between necessary and necessary and sufficient criteria. So when you want a, a necessary class restriction, then you use subclass of. And this basically means that you, you, um, uh, you define things that everything in your class has. So all the properties, all the property values of your class members. This does not fully specify your uh, class though. For this you also need sufficient conditions uh, which you then use equivalent class to for. So uh, from this you can infer class membership of individuals. So let me give you an example. If I want to, um, to have a necessary condition for um, a human then I would say um, uh, the, two legs or um, um, there must at least be uh, warm blood or they, they so, so some generic properties that human beings share. Um, but this isn't the only, these are not the only things in the world that have these properties. 
So if you define a car with something with four wheels, that's that's uh, um, uh, wouldn't be sufficient because you might find a um, a wheelchair or a a buggy for children, which also has four wheels, um, but is not a car. So with the subclass relation, you just give necessary conditions. So every car has needs to have four wheels. This doesn't say the other way doesn't work the other way around that everything that has four wheels is a car. So that would be using a subclass relation, um, not strong enough for really defining what a car is. So if you recognize something with properties where you think, oh yeah, that could be a car, I could maybe infer that this is a car, this won't work because you only have uh, given it the necessary conditions that a car must have four wheels. If you give it an equivalent class, our equivalent class, necessary and sufficient conditions, then you can also do the inference the other way around. So if you say uh, a cars are, have four wheels and a motor and um, um, need at least one driver um, and have to be at least two meters long, if this is your what you believe really a car should be, then if you see something with exactly these properties, that should be sufficient then to derive that the thing you see with these properties is a car. So in this case, you would define your, your class car as our equivalent to a, a, something that has four wheels, is two meters long and has a motor and a driver. So let's see how uh, this is applied in practice. We have some examples. Um, this is an example where we define all the members of a class um, which have at least some value from a specified class. It's called the, the uh, existential um, uh, restriction because it uh, follows a feature from also first order logic or, or predicate logic, uh, which is restricted from of existential quantification. So here's the example, we define uh, the class A, in this case to be a subclass of C, so that's less important, but this is now the necessary and sufficient condition to define the class uh, A with some property. And this property is that you have, it's of a type restriction, and it's a restriction on a particular property, namely P, and the restriction that is applied on P is that some of the values from P must be in B. So it's an existential quantification that there exists something in a XP relation with the property that it is in the class B. So basically what does this mean if I do uh, inferencing on this? Uh, if I have a statement that A is of type, type um, is related with P with a B, and if I know that B is of type B, then I can derive that A is of type A. Why is it the case? Because now I have something in an, uh, in an P relation with A, and this something B is, in a, is, a, is of type B, which, which adheres to the criterion, these two criteria. So that basically means that uh, A has these properties, which is a necessary and sufficient condition. So I conclude that A must be a um, must be of type A. Let's give a more concrete example, um, and that is uh, uh, all members of a class have at least uh, some values from the specified class now in the context of Nobel Prize winners. So we define the class of Nobel Prize winners as persons with the specific property that they have won something and the one thing that they won must be a Nobel Prize. They could have won something else, we'll get to that later, but they won something and that's the Nobel Prize. So now that we find an object Marie Curie, who is in a one relation with the physics Nobel Prize in 1903, we know that the physics Nobel Prize is of type Nobel Prize, so because of this information, we can conclude that Marie Curie is a Nobel Prize winner. So Nobel Prize winners is exactly the class of all the persons who have won 
at least one Nobel Prize. Let's give an example where this is, does not hold, namely if we only give it, make this a necessary, a, a necessary condition. So this basically states that um, if you are a Nobel Prize winner, you must have won a, every, every Nobel Prize winner must have won at least one Nobel Prize. But this does not, not yet allow us to take the conclusion that Marie Curie is a Nobel Prize winner because there might be more properties of the Nobel Prize winner class that are not specified here. So this is where also the, the open world assumption hurts in a way. So basically what, what do we do here? The difference is that we have a subclass relation here now, and that is a Nobel Prize winner must have at least a nomination for a Nobel Prize, um, because unless you have been nominated for a Nobel Prize, you will not have won a Nobel Prize. But obviously, there are more people who have been nominated for a Nobel Prize who didn't win the Nobel Prize and therefore are not Nobel Prize winners. So from the fact that Marie Curie is a Nobel Prize winner, we can infer that she has been nominated for a Nobel Prize. But this way, we cannot infer that she is a Nobel Prize winner if this is the only information we have. So basically the Nobel Prize winners is a subset of all the persons who were nominated for the Nobel Prize. And because of the open world assumption, we cannot then conclude, and rightly so, that this means that she is also a Nobel Prize winner. So I already said that um, uh, we, this is a restriction where you say there must be one object with a certain property in a relation. We can also specify that all the objects in this relation must have a certain property. So this is then the all members of a class have only values from a specified class. The all is a universal restriction, and that is written down like example A, the class is a subclass of this complex concept here again, namely the one that on the property P that holds the restriction, namely that all the values must be from B. And now if we have the information that A is related to B and A is of type A, then we can derive that this B in, this, uh, in the relation must of type B because this has been specified here. So let's get back to our um, Nobel Prize winners. Um, so the Nobel Prize winners um, um, are of a type um, uh, a, a subclass of a price. So every Nobel Prize is a price. And it's also um, um, something that can only have been won by a Nobel Prize winner. So if you're not a Nobel Prize winner, you cannot have won a Nobel Prize. Yeah. So this is basically if a Nobel Prize has been won by someone, this someone needs to be a Nobel Prize winner. So the physics Nobel Prize in 1903 was won by Marie Curie. Um, and the uh, physics Nobel Prize is, is a prize. So then uh, Marie Curie will be a Nobel Prize winner. So you can derive this, this fact. Um, why don't we use the, the range restriction here? So why don't we just say that one by has the range uh, Nobel Prize winners? The answer is that uh, there are other things that can be won by. So uh, a, a piano competition uh, could also be won uh, by someone and not necessarily this person will be a Nobel Prize winner. So this is, far, this is what I said in, in a couple of lectures ago, that uh, RDFS range is, is far too coarse for modeling uh, if you want to really apply them to specific classes. So let's look at another example. Um, if we now um, so sort of over specify, we also get not, not uh, all the intended or desired um, uh, inferred statements. Let's look at this example. The Nobel Prize winners is now defined as the, um, the class of people who only won Nobel Prizes. So basically everything that's in a one relation must be of type Nobel Prize. And 
that obviously doesn't allow us to take any conclusion, no inferences out. So if we know that Marie Curie won the physics Nobel Prize and the physics Nobel Prize is a Nobel Prize, we cannot infer anything about Marie Curie because she might have won the piano competition in 1901 um, and that would not have allowed us uh, to um, um, to uh, draw the conclusion that she then is a Nobel Prize winner. What this would allow us to conclude though, if we know that she's a Nobel Prize winner and we know that every Nobel Prize winner only wins Nobel Prizes, we would be able to derive that the piano competition 1901 must be a Nobel Prize. And this obviously is a very strange result, so you have to be very careful when you use your, your um, all value restrictions on a, on a property that you don't overcommit because this is obviously an unwanted and not correct uh, inference. So basically what this says is that your model is not correct and this is basically the restriction down here which is incorrect namely that all Nobel Prize winners only won Nobel Prizes. So another way of uh, doing these class restrictions, we had a uh, now two typically predicate logic uh, type of statements, I would call it, uh, namely existential quantification. There exists some value of, um, there could also be a, a universal quantification. So all the values of have a certain property. You can also specify a specific value. So you want a specific type, for example, the Fiat Uno, to give it one specific value and that is the fiat uno model value that you would give it here so that everything that is on the model uh, property must be exactly one object so in this case if you have a car which has a type fiat uno then you can conclude that it must have the model x fiat uno model and the, the important thing is that this is now an instance so you relate a class by making sure that it, 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 it must, all the instances of it have, must have speci one specific relation to one specific object. And this works uh, the other direction as well. So if you now define it as an equivalent class that uh, all the models must have this certain uh, uh, value, namely the specific object, the Fiat Uno model object, that if I have a car with a certain model, um, namely this specific instance, then I can derive that it, it is of a certain class of a certain type. So this is a very powerful method if you want to uh, identify a class with something that is in relation to exactly one object um, and not necessarily an entire class of things. So first we had existential quantification, there exists exactly one. Then we had a universal quantification that says for all the things that are in a relation, there's a certain property. And then we had the specific instance that something is related to. Sometimes you only want to say that there are, for example, exactly three uh, legs for a unicorn or four wheels for a car. Um, sometimes you want to say that there are at least um, uh, n values to some class uh, and sometimes you want to restrict them uh, with a maximum restriction and saying okay there, there, there are, can only be four wheels if something has five wheels then it's not a car um, so if uh, uh, the, the maximum value for something to be accepted to be a bicycle is three you would probably say two, but you might say a bug feature. So, so these uh, Dutch things with three wheels is also a bicycle. So you say the maximum number of wheels of a bicycle is, uh, is, is, is three. The minimum must be one, uh, but the maximum would be uh, three. So this is something you can write down now, given the the cardinality statements. And one of them is to say the, the, the qualified cardinality statements are those in which you specify of, of which type the things are. So basically this example is saying that you have on the property has part, um, a minimum qualified cardinality means that you have at least four things, 
and they must be of element lag. So if you want to define a giraffe, this would be a way to say there are, it has four parts. Um, the four is an integer type, so a, 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 a literal, and it must be on the class lag. So here we talk about the class lag. So in, in, in this way, I would now have defined a giraffe with four legs, but here, of course, we talk about tables. So a table is something that has at least four legs. Um, and now basically everything you find with four legs, so if you find a specific table that has four parts and all of them are legs, then you can derive that my thing that I have is of type table. The point is here again, the, the open world assumption applies that if in your database you only find three things, three parts of this, the table, then you cannot derive that it's not a table because it might well be that you haven't discovered the fourth table, uh, the fourth leg, that you haven't seen it, that it hasn't been modeled. Yeah. So the only thing that you can derive from seeing four legs is that it is a table. If you have less than four, then uh, you cannot derive anything. So you can specify that a table has exactly, needs exactly four legs. You can specify that a table needs at least four legs with a min qualification qualified cardinality. You could say that it needs has at least three. Um, it can't have more than six legs. So this is what you can say with these min, min qualified cardinality or max qualified cardinality. What you see here with this uh, example is that um, here someone has modeled a table uh, to need at least four legs, which is I think a very questionable modeling decision because you can have a perfectly well uh, table with three legs or even one leg. Um, but this is how this person, thinker, is seeing the world and has modeled the world. And now we can discuss things, but the point is that we can draw conclusions, conclusions out of this definition according to the definition of mean qualified cardinality and not because we believe anything to, to about tables to be true or false, but because we have the knowledge that Hinke has modeled here that his tables need at least four, four legs. So remember again, we have the difference between the, uh, the necessary and necessary and sufficient conditions. So here we just say that if something is a table, it must have at least four, four legs. But this does not imply that if we find something with four legs, that it must be a table. So we can't infer that something is a table only because we see the four parts, because we don't know um, whether there are any additional properties for something to be a table uh, that have been specified here. This is a very important distinction that you should really understand and that you have to be careful in your own models to, to make this really correctly. You can define things as a, a, a class as something that is always in relation to itself. So uh, we have the perfect example in uh, the United States at the moment uh, with the narcissus being defined as the uh, restriction on the property loves uh, with itself. So the narcissist is someone who is in love with, his, with himself. So if uh, Donald Trump is of type narcissist, then we can derive that Donald Trump loves Donald Trump. So it's one of the operators that are sometimes useful to have. So let me remind you, because this is really something we'll, I'm sure we'll get lots of questions about, um, why you can derive certain things if you have necessarily class necessary class restrictions with subclass of then you can derive all the properties that the subclass has um, no, sorry the superclass has for your newly defined class you cannot infer uh, more about this unless you have defined necessary and sufficient class restrictions with our equivalent class and then you can really infer class membership of individuals about uh, from these class definitions. One more thing you can say in OWL is that uh, two things and two classes are the same or are different. 
Um, so basically here we have, a, a, we can state that two individuals are different or are the same. So Venus is the same as the morning star and as the evening star, uh, but it is different from Alpha Centauri. And that basically means that every property that the morning star has will also be shared with the, the Venus and every property that the evening star has will be shared with the Venus. But this does not mean much more. But what this infers well is that the morning star is the same as the Venus and the evening star. So that is sort of the, the, all the combinations that you can find here. And that is different from the Alpha Centauri because we also know that Venus has this property. And the same holds obviously for the evening star. Um, you can also say that a property does not hold between two individuals. So if you have a, um, a, a blank node, which is of type owl negative property assertion, and you, um, uh, you have a, a source individual and then a certain property um, and uh, an, a target individual. So this is a construction that says that um, um, Amsterdam and Brussels are not located in the same uh, uh, place so that they have different uh, locations and it's a rather complicated uh, uh, syntactic construction but it basically tells you that on this location located in relation there is a negative property assertion so that they, it means that they do not have the same uh, uh, results on the source and on the target site on the subject and object.